someone who you may think is the outgoing, lively chap. There's a lot of intensity and raw emotion in this episode. This is the golden bike. One day you're on a high and the next day you just want to end it, you know what I mean? You want to quit. At the end of the day I would rather talk about it and get it off my chest. Message and he said, oh, uh, you're like, I just need to stop for a bit now. There's a lot of stuff mentally that can break you. I've seen a completely different side to you. <laughs> Jason, everyone knows you in the pool world, but this is the time where we want to get a little bit more information about you. Okay. I want to know how you got into pool. I want to know more about that. So, how old were you? How did you even get into it? So, my dad used to be a professional pool player and I started playing pool around the age of four years old. I had one of those little mini tables with little chopstick cues. Um, and you yeah, I just, yeah, I kind of got into it through that. And I just kind of went with my dad to tournaments, watched him playing. And then when I was around like seven, I went to like m with my dad to the World Championships of English eight ball pool. And it's like Scotland, Ireland, Wales, all different, you know, countries. Mm. And they go there. There's like thousands of people. It's actually kind of like a mini Moscone Cup type of thing. So I would go there with my dad all the time and I would just watch. And then he, Cena was like decent at the game. So he got me into the junior side of it. And I just kept playing and going. And I played for Scotland juniors when I was around about eight years old. And I just kept going and going and I enjoyed it. And my dad knew I had the talent to do it. And I always told him when I was around like nine or 10, I was like, this is what I want to do. And my mom's like, no, you need to go to school. You need to go to school. <laughs> my dad's like, I just leave him, you know, like all dads yeah. do. And um, yeah, I just always went to the events, watched all the good players. And I always used to get in trouble because there would be nobody allowed on the tables. So I would wait for all the matches to finish and run on and put all the extra balls that were left on the table. And they would shout on the mic, Jason, get off that table, <laughs> get off. And that's all you would hear all week. So I was like always trying to practice. How old are you at that point? 10. 10. And everybody always just, he's a little, he's a little, you know, shit. he's a little <laughs> shit. He's a little shit. And I used to just, but I think that's what, you know, I always wanted to play. And then I finally got, into the junior team mm. where I was they would select um, amount, like an amount of players to go and I think it was like 10 11 players and they seemed that I had a lot of talent so I ended up playing in the juniors uh, for like two or three years and then I won the world junior championship at English eight ball and then they realized I was really good so they put me in the youth team okay. when I should have been playing for the juniors but I could still play in the singles from the juniors so the following year, I was in the youth team, and I should have been in the juniors really, but because I was better, they like moved me up. Mm. And I won the World Junior Championship and the youth in the same year. So I just kept going every year and I was doing that. And then finally, when I got to the youth after one and a half years, they moved me to the under 21s. So I was with all these older people and I was still young. So I was kind of learning more and hanging around with older people and probably getting myself into trouble doing silly stuff, uh, following their leads. But my dad just used to take me everywhere and if it wasn't for him, then I don't think I would kind of be involved in pool because he was the one who took me all the time. So is that all eight ball pool then? Yeah, it was all English eight ball. Um, and then when I was around like 15, 16, um, I was always like, supposed to go to school and I would like take a change of clothes and I would like pretend I was going to school and I would just go straight to the snooker hall at like no. 10 in the morning and I would stay in there and then when it was like two three o'clock the end of school I would go to school and go in for the last two classes and then come out and go home like everything now <laughs> school I'm like yeah it was great I, never I did that. this for like six months and then I went home one day and my mum was like, how's school? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, you haven't been going for six months. And I'm like, ah, uh, she's like, where have you been going? And I'm like, oh. so I, you know, I was like the snooker hall. And she's like, 
just tell me the truth where she thinks I'm like doing other stuff like drugs down yeah, the corner yeah like <laughs> drugs or hanging doing something I'm like no I've been and she's like there's no way that you've been going who, who would let you in? so I knew the owner of the snooker okay. hall and my dad kind of knew I was doing this I told him and I uh, ended up getting a job in um, the Craig Park Masters in Scotland the snooker hall yeah. so the first day I went there I was like to clean the tables and like fill the fridges and when I walked in the door, there was Graham Dot, John Higgins, Alan McManus, Jamie Burnett, Stephen Maguire, uh, um, Anthony McGill. They were all like the house pros in this So club. how old are you at this point? 16. You are 16. Right, so wow. I, I'm like 16 and I'm in this club and then when I walk in, I'm like... But my dad knew who John Higgins was okay. from a few years before and they're still like pretty good friends when they see each other. It's not like they call, but... When they see they have a good chat and a drink and stuff yeah. and um i ended up working in the snooker club for like a year and a half and i was gonna get into snooker and i was doing really well when john higgins actually put me into one tournament he paid my entry to play in like the it was like the pro-am they have pro-ams okay. in the snooker clubs and i played in that club for like a year and a half and i was doing really well and i was getting into snooker and i thought this is what i want to do and I was doing really well. I was making 100 breaks like every day. And I thought, I knew I had the talent, but just have to get with the right people to, you know, in snooker, you need like a good coach. You know, you got mm. to put in a lot of hours. And everything was going good. And then one day I went outside to go home and these two guys attacked me because I was in where I live. Mm. I was in a different area. Okay. So it was like kind of gangs if you're not from that area you had to watch where you were going and stuff it's like in that Scotland. yeah and it was it, it's always kind of been like that when i was younger so i ended up fighting with these two guys and they're like beating me up they're like kicking me in the face they've got my hood over my head i got you know and i picked up a bottle that i seen in the street and i whacked the guy in the face with it and mm -hmm. i left and anyway this guy was like bleeding and i went home and i told my dad but i didn't tell my mom and then um, about two days later, when I went back to work on Monday, I got pulled into the office. Anyway, the guy who was the owner of the club, it was his nephew I'd hit with a bottle. But they attacked you first. But they attacked me, but he let me go. He got rid of me, he, like fired me basically. No. And then I, I just quit playing, I quit playing snooker. But at that time, when I was 16, the IPT had just came along. Okay. And I was in London. Which is they, the pool. The yeah, IPT is the pool. Yeah, yeah. IPT is American pool. Yeah. And it was like big money. It was like crazy amounts of money. I think it was like half a million dollars to the mm -hmm. tournament I played. And I ended up getting into American pool because they had an event. It was called the Empire, Empire State Pool Tour, okay. which was in all Riley clubs. And I went down there and played in like two events. And there was a gentleman there called uh, Mark Segal. Yeah. Big, big tall. He actually looks like Steven Segal. He's <laughs> like huge, wears a suit, like walks really, you know. Um, and he, he was like a sponsor for a lot of players, like Imran, Tony Drago, um, Daryl Peach. There was, he was like their manager type of thing. Okay. And he seen me playing. I got to the semi final of one event and I lost Hill Hill to. Neil Raybone, who's an English eight ball player, and he came up to me and he was like, approached me, and I'm like, well, who's this guy? I'm like, I really, I, was, I thought he was going to attack me. So you're still about 16 at this yeah, point? Yeah, 16 okay. at this point, and that was after the snooker thing, and yep. I'm like, well, what am I going to do now? I wanted to continue to do that, but I had nowhere to play. So I go to this tournament, I do well, and this guy comes up and he's like, and I'm like, oh, yeah, what, 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 where's the bottle? What, 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 do you, what, do you, what do you want? And he's like, no, no, no. He's like, um, you play amazing. He's like, you, you really are a good player. He's like, I would like to bring you down to London to play in these qualifiers. He's like, I'll contact you. So I went home thinking, yeah, you know, he's probably just saying that. I didn't know who the guy was. So he came, came to, I, I went there and then he came over to me, gave me his number. And I thought, I'll call him and see what. So I called him, he says, right, I've put you in this tournament. Um, 
I'll, I'll pay for you to come to London, we'll pick you up, we'll put you in a hotel and you'll play in this event and it's like the top two qualify to go to Reno, Nevada. And I'm thinking, Reno, I'm like, so I'm like checking all this up. And I get there and the guy picks me up in a Rolls Royce from the train station. And I'm in the back and I'm like 16 and I'm like, I'm on my oh own. Gosh. I just, just, I couldn't believe it. So he takes me to a hotel, it's like 2.50 a night, big fancy hotel, I've got like a... And you've gone on your own to Gone this. on my own, I've told my dad. Yeah. And he said, well, my dad kind of let me know. Yeah. He's like, you're daft enough to go, go, go ahead. <laughs> so I went there and I did this and I go to this hotel and I've got like a jacuzzi. And no. I'm like, what? I, I, I really was thinking to myself, oh, this is crazy, I, you know. So I go to the pool room and I walk in the pool room and there's Marcus Chomet. Mika Eminen, Raj Hundal, um, Rico Dix, Dimitri Jungo. No. Yeah, really? right. Okay. So I walk in the pool room and I'm like, what? And I, do you know these people at this stage? Yeah, because I had watched the World Championships okay. up that Matchroom had back in the day. In Cardiff, yeah. In Cardiff, right? So I've seen all these guys on TV. Okay. So I go in the pool room and I'm like, this is, this is just like surreal. Mm. So go in there and they're all practicing together. So I'm like, just go right over to them. I'm like, how oh, he's doing? I'm chasing them. And they're like, oh, how nice to meet you. And they were actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, and I think Steve Knight was still around at that time. So I'm in the pool room and end up playing in the tournament. And I get down to the final three players. And there's only two that gets picked. And there's me, Dimitri Jungo, and Rico Dix. And we had to play each other one time. And then it was like whoever did well or if it went to like a playoff. And I ended up beating Rico Dix. And then Dimitri beat me. And then he beat Dimitri. So we had to go through like a, another match to mm -hmm. play each other. And I ended up winning my match. And they he lost to him. So me and Dimitri got picked. And Rico Dix never got picked. So the guy comes up to me and he's like hugging me and I'm like, wow, this is, and he's like, you're going to, you're going to Reno. This is like one of the biggest tournaments ever. So he gets on the phone to my dad and he says, right, pack your bags. I'm going to bring you down to London and we'll mm. all fly to Reno together. So I'm like, um, I just didn't really, just I felt so young. I didn't really understand it as much. And anyway, two days later, we're on a flight to America. Going to play in this tournament, it's like five hundred thousand. What's your mum saying at this point? My mum, no, my mum's like, I'm so happy, and I'm like, you told me not to go. Like, <laughs> you know, now she's like, yeah, but I'm so worried about you, yeah. and you know, I just want to make sure you're, which you know, I, I get that, and um, yeah, I go to America, and now I'm in this hotel in Reno, and I'm walking around the blackjack tables and the slot machines, and I'm not allowed to go into the casino mm -hmm. but in the event you had to wear a suit no you had to be dressed in a suit every single player had to be dressed in a suit so is this nine ball now this is or is it still eight eight ball. ball okay this is american eight ball okay so i'm there and you got to be dressed and at this time a couple of snooker players were in the events too ronnie played okay jimmy white Tony Drago, they were all there. Yeah. So everybody's all dressed in suits. And th when I'm in London before I've gone, the guys took me shopping. <laughs> so he's got me suits and all that. And I'm thinking, I'm in the room with this suit on and all dressed up with a bow tie. And I get there and I'm all dressed up and I go to the event and there's like just all the best players, Bustamante, Efren, wow. Johnny Archer, like all the top, top players that yeah. I'd been watching for years and like in the nine ball events on TV, Ralph Suke, Thorsten, and I was just like, I was just in shock because I'm thinking to myself, two weeks ago, I'm in Scotland in a snooker hall, Getting and now, up. yeah, now, <laughs> now I'm in, I'm in Reno. And I'm playing in this tournament that's five hundred thousand dollars to win. I'm walking around with suits on and everything, so it was just a, a crazy, um, like growing up to going from English eight ball and doing really well, to then like playing snooker for like a year and a half mm -hmm. and thinking I wanted to do that, and then something crazy happens, and then all of a sudden I'm in America. Yeah, and it was just I'm, like two weeks at that just transition. Yeah, it was just it just it was crazy. So I'm in America and I'm playing in these events and. My first group, I draw Johnny Archer, Tony Drago, Rodolfo Lua, Filipino guy who was an amazing player. Mm. And um, who else was in my group? Um, 
Daryl Peach, I think, and okay. another guy who plays English shape, but with Yannick Bouffis from France. And my first match was against Tony Drago, and I beat him. Were you shitting uh, yourself at that yeah, point? Yeah, <laughs> I was. I was. I was really nervous because there's all these people, TV cameras, yeah, and yeah, yeah. it was like really. They had like a big green room where you would go in, and it was all fancy food. There was masseuse in there, massage chairs. Like oh, it wow. was wild. And um, I played Tony Drago, and I beat him eight four the first match. So everybody's like, and I'm like, yeah, it's like, come on, yeah. like, screaming. And then I have to play Johnny Ultra next. Okay. And I beat Johnny Ultra right after it. And and I was just like a potting machine, right? Yeah. Just that man, I've no safety, no nothing. It's just well, no ball. fear as well, no probably. No fear, yeah, no nothing. And then I play Rodolfo Lu out next, and everybody's saying, oh, this guy's one of the top Filipino players. And I beat him right after I beat Johnny Archer. So now I'm like, I'm through in my group because yeah. in each group it was like, for every match you would win, you would get more money. Okay. So I ended up getting through and there was like 256 players in the event. And I got through a couple of groups and I got down to the last group and I ended up with Efren, Daryl Peach, um, another couple of like top players, I can't remember who they were. And I ended up having to, win my last match against Efren and I had to beat him eight to two but this was when Efren's like in his prime yeah okay. and I was so like I, I kind of just like closed up I never really played my game Frozen I was up. more like thinking oh man I'm playing Efren Reyes like it was more of a like a wow thing for me yeah. instead of just playing my game and he beat me eight to and he went on to win the event and I stayed around there and I just like was like this is crazy and I was thinking well now I, I've kind of like made a little name for myself people know I can play okay. so I, I think I finished like 42nd place and I got like $20,000 oh my god right? so I'm like wow I finished and so the guy's like no problem we'll, we'll take care of everything when you get home and we'll sort you out with the money and then I got home I was home for a week and then the tour folded Kevin Trudeau went to, he was going to jail for like fraud and all that stuff. Oh my God. Yeah, it was like... So you never got your 20... No, we did get paid our money, we did get paid, but it okay. was like in installments because it, yeah. something happened where they had a, a deal with the, like a casino gambling, online gambling, okay. but it all fell through, so that's why the tour folded. So what's going through your mind at this point? So I'm point? at home now and I'm thinking, what's, what's just happened there? Like in the last month I've went from kind of good to bad to amazing to like oh my god something's yeah. good and at that time Carl Boys was he was he did really well yeah he I think he finished in like the top eight in the rankings and they were making I think they made over like 50 60 thousand in a couple oh of god. events and we were all saying this is going to be our we're going to make you know we're going to be yeah. like a rich pool player at the time and then all of a sudden it came <laughs> from going back to London to these tournaments in Riley's and everybody's like well that was a bummer, right? We thought we were all going to be rich in yeah, like a couple of years. Because 8-Ball was our background. All yeah, the English okay. guys came from English 8-Ball. And it was just crazy. So then now we're back at 2007. And I'm like, okay, what do I do now? So I went back to playing English 8-Ball. Okay. And I did pretty well. And then in 2010, I won the Men's World 8-Ball Championship. And... After that, I had played in a couple of Euro Tours. Because Which is I, nine ball. Yeah, nine yeah, ball. So. so I was kind of going back and forward because okay. I had played the IPT and I thought, I'm good at it. Maybe I could learn something. So I'd seen um, Darren had came over to the States at 2007 and he was like making a big name for himself. Mm. And I knew deep down that I had a lot of talent at that age. And I thought, well, if he could do it, why can't I do it? So me and Carl Boys used to hang around a lot when he was on tour, and we used to, you know, oh, trouble make, trouble make trouble. <laughs> yeah, we were just we were just going there to get drunk. We weren't bothered yeah. about the pool. It was like parties. That's all yeah. it was. So everybody used to say he's a bad influence on you. You know that you you should just get away from him. And I'm like, no, That's Carl's so good. Funny. We're going to the bar. We're drinking. <laughs> we're having fun. No, it, honestly, it will help your game. He's a bad influence. And I'm saying, no, it's not. we so then. After a few times of going to these tournaments in England and London, 
someone came up to me and said, oh, Mark Gray was. Yeah. Mark Gray said to me, you should go to the States and have a go at it. He said, what's the worst thing that can happen? Mm. You know, you'll, you'll, um, you'll come back and play pool. He said, but you should have a go and definitely. And I was like, nah, and boys, he's like, don't be stupid. Don't go there. You'd have to stay in England, go to the Euro Tours and play English eight ball. Mm. And I was like, so I just kind of let it go for a few years. And then when I won the World Eight Ball Championships, I then decided there was nothing really else for me to do in that game because I'd won a lot of big events and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go have a go at nine ball. So my sister's husband now, my brother-in-law, he was sponsoring me at the time to go to the Euro Tours. I was going to say, how, what, how were you affording to be able to go to these different places and what stopped you from going to the US? Is, was it money and backing? Yeah, it was more, it was more money going to the US. Um, I think when I was, around 2007 and eight, I was playing English eight ball, but every weekend that you'd win a tournament, you get like a thousand pounds. Okay. So it's not like a lot of money, right? Mm. And Any job on the side at yeah, that point? Yeah, well, I had a job on the side working for my dad's friend too. So he used to have a, um, you know, like when they build houses and they put all like new cable in to the okay. houses, like all the wires and all the plugs and that. All He owned a company, like a digital company. Okay. And I got a job with him through my dad and I basically was in a van with a guy yeah. going around so if someone's TV wasn't working and the wire on the roof had like came out the dish yeah we had to go up onto the scaffolding and like try and fix it or go in the house and retune the TVs and all that it's actually a pretty good job it wasn't that hard yeah. other people were out there having to like drill the holes in the houses run the cables you know like yeah. when they're first doing the houses so we kind of got the easier job of it and um, I did that for a while and I was getting paid good money from that too, but it wasn't enough to just up and go and say, I'm going to the States and, mm. and that'll, that'll be enough to do that. So I did that for a while and I played the Euro Tours thanks to my brother-in-law now. Yeah. And he knew that I had a lot of potential too, because he did put me in a lot of English pool events back mm. then. Um, and he helped me, he kind of supported me. And I, for him, if it wasn't for him around probably 2008, nine, up until about 2012, 13, I probably wouldn't have been able to play in a lot of events that I went to. And he helped me a lot, so I'm, I'm thankful for him for doing that. Um, and obviously his family, and he, he helped me a lot. So that, that stage of going to play the Euro Tours, he was helping me with all the you know, expenses. It, it's not cheap to go. You're no. probably spending around 1,500 hotel flight and then entry fee and stuff like that and when i'm going to these events i know i'm I'm good enough and i can run out but the the safety side of the game was really tough tough because that's what i had to learn my partner ability was there it was more learning the break how to jump how to kick when not to go for a crazy shot and sell out the game and um i started doing well in the euro tours i got to like the last 16 the quarter final um, and I never really got past any of that until mm. around like 2012. I think okay. my first one, I ended up getting beaten the final by Ralph Suki in Treviso, um, Italy. And Ralph beat me in the final. And then after that, I thought, you know what? I'm going to go to the States for the US Opens. Okay. That's when Barry Berman had the US mm. Open. And um, I played in that a couple of times previous to, to my English pool thing, because in Scotland, they had a nine ball like tour. Okay. And they would have a qualifier for the US Open. And I won it two times. And I went to the States with my dad. Okay. And I played in the US Open, but I didn't play in it in 2010 and 11. And then finally I went back in 2012 and I finished ninth place and I lost to Jose Perica. And there was an older gentleman there from England mm. who lived in the States, and his name was um, Jeff, and he was like a he was like a steak horse guy, okay. and he knew like Jeff Conway's name was. Okay. He was like a sponsor of like Daryl Peach, all the English guys he knew really well, and he came up to me and he said, "Hey, 
you play amazing. Would you be willing to stay in America for three months? Mm. I'll let you stay in my house and I'll put you up and I'm thinking, what is this old guy like staying in his house? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, I just didn't know who, who he was. And then I spoke to a couple of people saying, no, he's, he's a good guy. Yeah. He does that with players. He'll like take them around and try and win money. So I called my dad and I'm like, this guy wants me to stay for three months. My dad's like, yeah, my mom's like, who's this guy who wants you to stay in his house for three <laughs> months? Who mom. is he? <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, no, it's, I'm going to stay. So I ended up staying in the States with this guy. I left from uh, for, uh, Chesapeake, Virginia. Yeah. We drove to Charlotte, North Carolina, and he had like a sick house. It was unbelievable. It's like, it's like a half a million. So how old are you at this point? I am 23 at this point. Okay, 23. 23. Uh, yeah, 23. So I go to this guy. I'm driving to this place. And, you know, he's an English guy, so we got on pretty well. Yeah. And get to his house, and he's like, this is my house. And I'm like, um, like what the, what's going on here? Which is unbelievable. It's just a sick house. So he gets inside, and he's got, like, two stories. He's got like a pool table and a private room and everything which and I'm like, wow, I've had it off here, like this is amazing. Mm. So we goes to some pool rooms around there, hustles a little bit, makes thousand a day, five hundred a day. And then after like a month and a half, he says, Right, we're gonna go to my other house and I'm like, What do you mean go to you? And he says, I've have a house in New York. So I said, Yeah, no problem. So anyway, we drive from Charlotte to New York, which is like ten hours, eleven hours mm. and we gets to New York and the guy lives in the Hamptons and I gets to his house and he's got like a big swimming pool and he's got his own house with a, a guest house attached to it and he's like you'll stay over here so I gets in and I've got like same again a big jacuzzi 60 inch TV on the wall my own space everything like that and he's like this is where you'll live for the next month and a half the pool room in New York's like an hour and a half away. We'll just travel there every night. So what were you doing? So you were basically staying there for like a month and a half and what, just going hustling every yeah, night? Yeah, so we'd go to New York. So when I went to New York, Steinway Billiards was the first pool room I went to. Yeah. And Earl Strickland was a house pro. Okay. So when I walked in the pool room, he was in there and they used to have a five by ten table, like a bigger version of a nine foot. Okay. And... Um, I went in there and he was there in the pool room with just, there was action everywhere. Yeah. So Jeff's like, oh, this is Jason. Mm. So nobody kind of knew who I was. But well, that's the point, right? So yeah, you can... but then when I went in the pool room, two people knew who I was. Okay. So now all my action was ruined. Mm. It was like, oh, he's too good. You can't give him weight. You can't do this. You can't so do that. what sort of money were you earning on a night like that, for instance? We were earning like 1000 a night, 1500 okay. a night. And that was good yeah. for me. I'm getting half of the money. So I'm yeah. not spending a penny. No, you're staying in this lovely guest a house lovely with the house. I'm getting all my food paid for. I'm getting chauffeured around. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm basically just making money. And... Um, Gets in the pool room and I'm looking to try and hustle a little bit. But then this guy knew who I was and oh, he just finished ninth in the US Open. And I'm like, okay, right, so what do we, we do now? So I said to Jeff, I said, look, I don't mind doing this hustling thing, but I don't want to do that. I want to be the best player. Okay. I want to I want to make a name for myself. I want to become one of the top players. Because okay. I'd seen all these other guys like at the US Opens, all their banners and wearing green jackets and all that. And I thought, I want one of them. Yeah. I, I, I want to win one of those. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I did tell my dad that the first time I went. I said, I want one of those jackets. I said, that I'd love to win this tournament. And my dad's like, well, if you just keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, my dad's like, he knew I had the talent. And I got to the pool room and nobody would play me. I played a couple of guys, but it was like 100 bucks, yeah. 200 bucks. And I said to him, look, just, just let me play whoever. You know, and he was like, oh, we want to hustle. We want to make easy money. And I said... Let me just play the guys. They're not going to play me. We've tried to get matches. Nobody wants to play. So So you wanted to play tougher players? Yeah, I wanted to play tougher players. But at this point in America, all the Filipinos were in the States at the time. Bustamante, Ronnie Alcano. And they were all in Steinway. So that's where they were all about. So I ended up arranging a match against Earl Strickland. Okay. So we played on his table, Mm -hmm. on the, the bigger table. And we played for 2,000, we played 1,000 a set. So we go home, 
We set it up for a couple of days. We come back to New York and I walk in Steinway and there's about 300 people in there. Mm. The live stream, all this stuff. Well, I was young. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll drill him. I don't yeah. care who he is, you know what I mean? And Earl's <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, Earl's like yapping, you know what I mean? He's talking and at that time he was still, he still plays amazing now, but he was really still, at that time, he was yeah. still well known as like a top player. And we go to the pool room and everybody's betting against me. Everybody, oh, you want to bet? Yeah, I'll bet Earl, I'll bet Earl. So we play the first set, we play two races to 21. Mm. And I beat him 21 12 for the first set. Absolutely battered him. Oh By God. the middle of the set, he was already saying, Oh, this guy shoots too straight. <laughs> blah, blah, he was going off, and I'm just running up. Like, this guy's nuts. Yeah. Just, you know, just kept. By the end of the first set, all these people that were betting on him, half of them left. No. They left because he went on tilt. He was on tilt. He couldn't. He, could, he was giving up games like with four or five balls left. So I beat him two sets. And then everybody's like, okay, this guy can yeah. play. So then I set up a match with Ronnie Alcano okay. on the same table, and I beat him too. No. So I'm like in New York, and I'm thinking, right, I'm, you know big, what I mean? Big like, yeah, I'm like, <laughs> you know what I mean? A big apple, yeah, like, yeah, let's yeah, go. Yeah. Like swaggering about the pool room, thinking I'm the shit. And I uh, played Bustamante, played Ronnie Alcano again. Then every week they would have Tony Robles at the time, okay. was living in New York. And he had the Predator Tour. It was like a, a big thing in New York. Okay. And um, every weekend they would have a pro in And it was 16 players or 32, whatever. So I just kept going to these tournaments every mm. weekend. And eventually I started winning them. Mm. And, and when you're playing these money matches, were they still, were they nine ball then? Yeah, they were nine ball. They were nine and ball so, some, some, some matches were ten ball, ball. But when I played Earl and Ronnie Alcano, and that, it was nine ball. Okay, right. So we played the nine ball and we, we were doing really well. And these events that Tony had was ten ball. Okay. And what was good about it was there was no luck involved in the, the, in the game because they made it call shot, call safe. So if you called, I'm going for the eight ball and you miss the eight and the eight would go up the table and go behind the nine, you could let the other guy go back to the table and shoot and say, well, it wasn't my fault that you missed that and got lucky. You have to shoot from there. Okay. So it took all the like, so you had to be like really skillful, right? Yeah. And at that time, obviously a lot of people would, at nine ball, you can get away with like making some lucky shots and whatever, yeah, right? Of and that's part of the game. So when I went there, I felt like, well, if I play well and do the right things, I can... I, I think I can beat most of these players. They're not going to get lucky on mm. me. So I ended up playing in all these events. And as the, the month, like the weeks went on, I ended up starting to win them. It was like Mika M and Bustamante, Ronnie mm. Alcano, Lee Van Cortez. There were all, all these guys. And I'm like, this is amazing. I'm getting to learn from these guys. The best, yeah. So I did that for like three months and it was great. And then my time was up. I had to go back because of my visa. Okay. So I got back home, I went home with like 30 grand. And I got back home to Scotland and I was at home and I'm like going out and buying all sorts of stuff. I'm just spending money, <laughs> like new clothes and everything. I walk around with like five grand in my pocket. My friends are saying, where have you got all this new stuff from? And I'm like, Me, you wouldn't believe what I've just did for like mm. three months. They didn't understand it because they were never into pool. Yeah. You know, and when I was younger, they'd be like, let's go party. And I'm like, oh, I've got yeah. a pool tournament. Playing pool? What are you playing pool for? That's, you know, like, that's stupid. Just come, let's go party. And I'd be like, no, make like a thousand. Yeah. I'd rather go make money. So I went home and I was at home for like a week. And I'm like lying in bed and I'm thinking, oh man, I like, I want to go back. You miss the buzz. But yeah, I want to go back. I want to, but this guy's like to me, come back when you want. Mm. So I was just lying in bed and I called him. I says, I want to come back. And he said, right, okay, I'll book you a flight. Mm. So I packed all my stuff and I said to my mum and dad, I'm going back to the States. <laughs> and they were like, Mom's like yeah, and they were like, what, you're going to go back? To, who are you going to? And I said, this guy's going to put me up again. So goes back to the States, does three months again, comes home with like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And I go home for two days. And I had, just before I went back the second time, I had bought two new pups. And I'd left them with my mum and dad, right? And they were American Bulldogs. These things were like big horses by the time I got home. <laughs> my mum and dad said, they've literally ruined your full room. They're like chewing everything. 
And I'm like, well, you know, there's a pups, you know what I mean? You got like, <laughs> and my dad's like, you got to get rid of these dogs before you go. So I went home the second time mm. for two days and I had to take my dogs and take them to a shelter. Oh. And I was like, I couldn't even, when I put them there, I couldn't even look back. I was like in tears. Yeah. Because, you know, I love dogs. I have dogs at home now and I just, I've always wanted to have my own dogs. Mm. When I finally got them, I had to give them up because I was going. But this time when I was going, I told my mum and dad, I'm not coming back. I said, I'm going for good. And they were like, how can you do that? You're going for three months. Yeah. Once your visas. And I said, I don't care. I'm staying. I'm what, going. What's going through your mind? What are you thinking? Are you going to go and marry uh, an no, American no, 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 no. I wasn't even <laughs> thinking at the time. I just thought, I'm going to go there. And people told me that if I went to America, yeah. I could stay for three months and I could just fly to Canada. And then my, uh-huh. my, my three months would like go back because you're flying out of the States. And I mm. thought, well, there's no point in me flying back to the UK. Yeah. There's nothing here for me anymore. So fly back to there, get back to, and I'm on my way back. And this guy calls me and says, Jay, you know, we've had some good times and that I'm getting divorced from my wife. And I'm like, She's it's, not, it's not me, it's not me, is it? It's not, because I'm staying at their house. I and I'm with this guy every night, yeah. all night. We're not getting home till late in the morning. And he's like, I'm getting divorced and I just can't have you staying with me and I can't get to do anything. So I'm like, I'm in New York. I'm like, where am I going to stay now? I've got money, right? But I'm thinking I'm going to have to pay for hotels. I'm going to have to pay for all my own food. Like now it's changed. Mm. But a lot of people knew who I was. So So you're like 25 at this point? 24. 24, okay. Yeah, 20. A lot happens like in a really short space of time with you. Like it can be two weeks and be a year. It was really really quick. So it was like six. So I went for three months, then I went for three months. And then on my final going back after six months, I'm there and I get to Steinway Billiards and Manny, the owner, I go in and I'm like telling Manny because he knew Jeff really well. And I said, Jeff is like told me Mm. he can't do nothing. He's getting divorced. So Manny said, look, I'll let you be the house bro here. Earl's the house bro. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so I'll let you be the house bro with him. You can come in here every day, practice. I'll feed you, whatever. Yeah. And I'll put you in the US Open coming up. Okay. We pay for Earl's apartment. He has an apartment. So you can live with him. Right? And I'm like... Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like, what? Well, what'd you say? And he's like... I have an apartment that we pay for Earl as the house pro. It's like right across the street. Mm. Now, you've got the apartment, you've got a movie theater, you've got a gym and the pool room in a square, like literally a hundred yards from each other. And I'm like, well, I've got nowhere. Do I want to go pay hotels like 200 a night or just do this? So, okay, now I'm sharing an apartment with Earl Strickland and I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> This is mental. I'm like, <laughs> I've watched this guy on TV, right, yeah. all my whole life of when I growing up. Because obviously I played English eight ball, but pool was always on TV back in the day. Yeah. World Pool Masters. The World Pool Masters was one of my favourite events. Okay. Because it was like a, an invite. It's yeah. where the World Nine Ball was like, you know, it's a big thing. But I liked always watching that event because it was the best 16 players at the time. Yeah. So I go there, ends up sharing the apartment with them. We're in the pool room every day. And I just literally sat back and soaked everything up that this guy was saying. Told me, now, I know a lot of people, he's say that he's mental on the table and he does this and he does that. Now, yeah, I get it, right? He is, he just, he's so passionate about the game. Mm. But off the table, he's one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my life. And I learned so much from that guy and I think he took my game to the next level because we would get up in the morning and he would always say to me, you have to stay fit. And he's like, I'm sleeping and I wake up and the guy's on the floor doing a thousand sit-ups. <laughs> and I'm like, honestly, I like wake up and I'm like, what's that noise? And he's there. <laughs> I'm like, this guy's mental. I'm like, and he's like, you have to, you have to stay fit. Hmm. I'm going for a seven mile run. This is back in 2000. He still does, he yeah. still does it to this day. So I'm like, I'm going to the gym. I'm not going out in the street to run that. It's not for me. And he's mm. like, so I would go to, I went to a boxing gym okay. that was close by and enjoyed doing that. So we would go do his workout. I would do mine. And then we'd go to the pool room and we'd okay. play pool all day from about 10 o'clock in the morning till about four or five o'clock. 
then when he was done, he wasn't interested in the gambling and all that. He would just go back to his, the apartment. But I would stay in the pool room and I would play people, give them weight, mm. gamble. And, you know, I was, I was still hustling people. I was making money, but I had to give up a lot of weight at this time. Yeah, okay. And I shared this apartment with them for almost a year. And it was just crazy. Some of the stories that this guy told me from growing up and and just what I had to do to get better and what I should do and what games I should be playing. And I just took all this in and soaked it all up and, and did everything. And then in that year of staying with him, I went to the US Open yep. and I finished third place. I lost to... It's funny. And it was ninth the, the time before, right? The, the You finished a lot later. I, I finished ninth the year before. Yeah. And then the fall, 2014, I finished third place, right? Okay. So I got, Shane was really quiet. Van when I, Yeah, when I first came on that scene, everybody's like, oh, Shane stays to himself, he's quiet, he doesn't really drink, blah, blah, blah. But at that time, I was still, you know, I was like partying and doing whatever. I still was enjoying myself, single life, <laughs> I'm in New York, was doing whatever I want. Yeah. So I ended up going to the bar table championships in Reno, the same place that I was in 2006. Yep. Yeah. So I went back and I'm like, I'm sure I've been at this hotel. And they were like, yeah, this is where they had the IPT. So we goes there. I started to get to know Shane a little bit. I would just okay. go up and like kind of chat to him. And he was still really quiet. Mm. And through one of his friends who I'm still friends with now, we would go bowling at night time together. Right. And a few nights we got drunk and we got him drunk. Which, which is, is all, funny, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it was really funny because <laughs> yeah. we had him like, you know where the bowling balls come out? Yeah, yeah. We'd have like, Shane was on top of there with bowling balls drunk and we've got pictures, still got pictures, so I have from back then. <laughs> okay. And he was started to like open up a little bit more mm. instead of just being like his, you know, staying himself, doing yeah. his own thing. And that year, he had won the US Open before, so he got a free room, not the year before, and when you win the US Open, you got like free entry, free, free hotel room, room yeah. all that stuff. So he got a free hotel room so I said to him hey you know like and he said well I get a free hotel room you can just share with me so we shared with each other so you've gone from Sharon Bell Strickland yeah, to Shane yeah, Van yeah. so I'm sharing a room with Shane at the US Open yeah. and we at that time I knew he was I knew he had like hearing problems and mm. all that stuff and we share a room but I didn't know at night time that he takes them out when he's sleeping. Okay. So I like wake up in the morning and I'm like, Shane, like Shane. And I'm like screaming, Shane. I'm like, and then I'm like, he's not even answering me. I'm like, is this a guy? Is he alive? <laughs> and then I like, like, like kick him and he wakes up and I'm like, oh, and he's like, <laughs> and I look on the side of the table and I see he's like, things are there. And he's like, I can't hear you. Yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. I take them out when I'm sleeping. So I thought, like, this is funny. Yeah. Like, I'm sure. Went from someone who doesn't stop talking to someone who doesn't even hear what I'm saying. Yeah. So we're in the room. It probably broke the ice between you two as well. Yeah, bit. it did. Because yeah. then we started to get on well with each other. Yeah. Obviously, I came across from there. And I was like, so we became good friends. And we shared the room. And we ended up playing each other in the hot seat. Oh, right, for the okay. US Open. Yeah. But at that time he was Shane and he was like, you know, he was he was in his prime at yeah. that time. And he ended up beating me in the hot seat and then I played Lee Van Cortez okay. to get back to the final and I lost Hill Hill and I was so sick and it was leading up to that I had I had stayed in um I stayed in New York with Earl and then Darren had invited me to his house in Pennsylvania okay. before the US Open to practice. So I went there for a week. And when I was there, my wife now, oh, Laura, right. yeah. had got in contact with me and Darren. They had Earl at their pool room to do an exhibition. Okay. And they found out that there was other pool players that did exhibitions and they wanted to get other pool players. But she got our my contact number mm -hmm. or Facebook, whatever, and contacted us saying, hey, I want looking for two more pros to come to the pool room and do an exhibition. So I went to the US Open with Darren at that time. We FaceTimed Aura and me and she showed the pool room. And I was like, oh, that's cool. So I went to the US Open. But when I went to the US Open, I didn't know that she'd been asking people about me 
right. trying to find out more about me. So, so people, she fancied you, basically. Yeah, but, <laughs> well, I had, I had spoke to her a, a little bit on the phone, and then yeah. I, I just texted her randomly and said, oh, so when are we going out? <laughs> and she texted me back saying, I just want to keep it uh, business only. So Go I on, thought, Nara. Oh, whatever, yeah, fine. Okay. So then I didn't know that she'd like, been asking these people while I was... I didn't know any of this. Mm. Um, uh, and people were just saying, oh, he's a party animal, he's, with, he's going with women, different women, this, and he's always drunk, and I'm like, oh, cheers, supposed to be my mate, you <laughs> know what I mean, he's all with me in. And anyway, I didn't, so then when I finished third place, mm. I was gutted, right? So I, I'm going back to New York, and she's messaged me saying, so when are we going out on the state, right? Yeah. So I've told her we'll go out, but because I've just got beat, hell, hell, I've literally stayed in the apartment for three days, turned my phone off, not, spoke to anyone. not even spoke to anyone, not even gone to the pool room, I'm in bits, right? Because I knew I could have won the US Open, yeah. and I was so close, and anyway, I pammed her off, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, so I didn't, so then after three days, I finally switched my phone on, yeah. and she's, oh, you've stood me up, oh, wow, and this is all, my phone's been broken, uh, I don't have an American phone, I've, I've just like lied to her, basically. Chaser. And, um... <laughs> Yeah, ended up, we meet Yeah, in after New York. that, and then we got together, and we were with each other for like, maybe three, three months, so I hadn't been home for over a year, like, just short of a year, and I went back home for like a week, and when I came back, she was pregnant. Oh, wow, okay. So when I picked her up, I'm like, man, she looks different. Boobs got bigger. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like uh, did you have a boob job? <laughs> she was like, like what? And I'm like, like, do they, do they look big? And she's like, no, 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 no. And then we went to where we were going, and um, I was like, man, I'm like something like yeah. something odd off. Yeah. And anyway, I said, I think you should go get like tested or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, she goes and gets tested, and then sure, she's pregnant. So now I'm like, I've gone from like living in New York and I'm thinking everything's great and now I'm, I'm like, shit, I'm going to have a baby. So let's just look at this. So, you, so at that point you're like, what, 26? 20, 25. 25. So you go, you've got Jason Shaw, he's like 16 years of age, bunking off school, annoying his mum because you're going to the snook hall, you're getting your fights and you quickly transition to like winning 20 grand, which I'm guessing was a, like a big stack of, of money course, at that yeah. point. And you're going from like 16 to now 25, where you were just probably party animal. Oh, I was. You weren't, you, well, you, no score or anything like that. And you're just thinking, well, I'm just going to go make money on port. Yep. I'm obviously good at it. Now what's going through your brain at 25 years of age? You've got to quit all this partying. What, what are you thinking on the pool side of things that now you've got a kid coming along? What are you going to do? You're, are you going to move to America? What? Yeah, so it was just, it was, it was, um, it was a weird one. So now... We're at the doctor's and she's like, we know she's pregnant. And now we're in the car and she's crying. My dad's going to kill me. <laughs> my dad's going to kill me. And I'm like, don't worry, I'll sort it. Don't worry. Oh like, I'm God. like, you know what I mean? She's like, no, my dad's like, my dad's like crazy. He's he, like, he doesn't believe in all this. Like he believes in marriage before. And I'm like, yeah. no, I don't worry. So when I find out our dad's like black belt in like Taekwondo <laughs> and he used to own like his own in Korea, he used to own his own like, a uh, big um, taekwondo he had like 250 students and I'm like um, maybe I won't say anything just yet so I started going from New York to Connecticut where I live now okay to Ara's mum and dad's they used to own the pool room which now I have okay I, I bought it from them me and Ara we bought it from her mum and dad yeah so we I started going there and her dad knew he knew the pool players because during well, they were uh, doing exhibitions, they weren't did they? Exhibitions, at their pool room. But before, in in that period of time where they had the pool room, the challenge, the ESPN Challenge of Champions, that there was uh, a nine ball event. It was every mm. year. They would take the f top four best players that had won all the big events, and they would pick the four best players. Okay. And you would go to Mohegan Sun, yeah. and it was um, you would play one, and it was like race to five, and then if it went to one set each, it would be a one game sudden death. 
So sounds very exciting. To yeah. <laughs> so so in this event, if you got invited, it was fifty k to the winner, and it was nothing for the other three players. You, you didn't get anything. You just got your hotel and everything paid for. Oh my gosh. So I ends up. They all these players are going through their pool room. Neil's flying. Dennis are called. So mm. they had took pictures where all these players yeah. that had gone through there before. So our so family was around the Yeah, pool. They, they knew. Uh, they, oh, people used to come here. You're Jason Shaw. You're a pool player. I've heard about you. And their dad used to always say, why is he here every day? Why, why is he come? And I used to say, oh, I'm here looking for action in New York. I can't get any. Whereas but, you're actually dating Ara. Yeah, but he doesn't know. Oh, my right? gosh. And, and, and she's pregnant at this time. Oh, my gosh. So, <laughs> but I've told Ara's mum. So Ara's mum's like really cool. She's yeah. like, you know, she's like really secret. She'll like hide stuff from yeah. you and all that. So I've told, I kept saying, she's like, oh, you're a great guy. And I said, to her, just joking. I was like, you want a, you want a grandbaby? Just like, you know, like just trying to like slide <laughs> oh it in there. Sort of, and she was like, yeah, nah, nah. and then after about two or three times telling her, she went, she's pregnant. And I was like, yeah. And she was like so happy, right? Because yeah. she's got two daughters and a son. And okay. this is like, something new and there were like 50 60 at the time so they're thinking grandbaby so she knew and she's like well you're gonna have to tell him so i'm like i'm not telling him yet like i could just see he was mental he's I'm like he's, he's gonna kill me so i kept going there every day and i would hang around for like two or three four or five days and i would be staying in a hotel around the corner <laughs> and ara would be working there so yeah. when ara's dad what he would do was he would go to the pool room he would open up and he would stay there until about six or seven o'clock and then he would leave and go do what he had to do. Yeah. So it was Ara and our mum and our sister who it was like a family business. Yeah. And I would go there after he left. Mm -hmm. So they would let me come behind the bar and everything and our mum was like really cool. And for six months, we didn't tell him. Oh my god. Six gosh. months and she had like a big bump and she was just wearing <laughs> longer dresses. And he didn't have a clue. He didn't have a clue. So then one day I seen how big she was getting. I said, we're going to have to yeah. tell him. It was like three months away from having the baby. So I like, he's got there one day and I'm like, hi, Joe, can I, can I speak to you? Me and Aura have to speak to you. And he's like, me, you and Aura? Why is Aura have to? And I was like, just... So I sat down with him in the office and uh, I said to him, look, you know, I'm we've been seeing each other and he's like you've been seeing my daughter and he's been telling her you can't date a pool player they don't make money they don't have a job they don't have anywhere to live they're just broke people like yeah, yeah, you know yeah. and he what he's not kind of like he's, yeah, he's not he's he's kind of true he's kind of true he's not you know yeah. he's not far off if you do the right thing yeah you can yeah. you know but he had seen these people around the pool room for many years just pool players they are hustling and uh He's like, yeah, what do you want to tell me? So I like sit down and I'm like, you know, been seeing each other for like six months. And he's like, you've been dating for six months? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, um, you know, at that point, obviously, within six months, we've been spent a lot of time with each other. She's pregnant, kind of like fell in love, basically. Mm. And um, I'm like, you know, she's, she's pregnant and we love each other and we're going to have a baby and that's it. I'm not going anywhere mm. and he was like okay he's like to get well good for telling me and he says I'll tell you one thing now and I'm like and he's like I'm like oh god what's he gonna say and he says if you ever get divorced and he looks at her and says I'll kill you first <laughs> and then he says and then I'll kill you and I'm like uh, I'm like yeah we're not gonna get divorced anytime <laughs> soon I don't fancy getting killed so anyway, we leave the office. And I'm sweating. I've yeah. got sweat patches down to my down to my waist, and I'm like, I, and she's like, I can't believe how well he's just taken that. Yeah. But I think he was like grandchild. He got to that, you know. So then I'm living in New York with Earl. Her dad's basically said to me, "Pack all your stuff. You need to move into our house." And I'm like, "What?" I'm like, "I'm living in New York." No, she's having your she's having your baby. You need to be with her. Yeah. So within two days, I've took all my stuff from New York, and now I'm living in Connecticut. And I'm like, this is mental. So I've got I, I've got a pool room where I can go practice. Yeah. yeah, I can do whatever I want. But now I'm in this house. I've never I don't really know her family that well. But now I'm with her like twenty four seven. So now I'm there, 
and we're going to these events together and I can't pot a ball. I can't no. pot a ball. I'm like, I'm in bits. So I'm thinking about the baby, right? I'm thinking, oh my God, we're going to have a baby. Like, what am I going to do? Like, yeah. we're going to have to get a job. Am I going to have to do something? Am I, how am I going to make money? Well, because you were only thinking about yourself before then. Getting, you only had to go exactly. day to day. Um, and then I'm getting, I'm getting everything for free. Mm. I'm getting a house for free. I'm getting free food. I'm going to go to the gym. I can do whatever I want. I've got yeah. no, no ties. So now I've gone from doing whatever I want to now living with Aura's family and I'm going to have a baby in three months. So what are you kind of thinking at that? Was it just, you just scared? Were I you... was, yeah, I was like really scared. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know how my, my, my life was going to pan out. You know what mm. I mean? I've, I've been gone from like doing well in events and doing whatever to now I can't pot a ball. So I'm showing up at these events and I'm getting beat straight away. Oh I'm like making no money. I'm getting beat first round, second round. So did you ever think about just dipping out at that point? No, and I thought to myself, I'm like, well, I can't dip out. I'm, li you know, she's pregnant. I would never do that to anybody. I would never. If if it got to the point, um, if I was going to dip out, I would have dipped out straight away. Straight away, I would have said, just get rid of it. Yeah. I'm not doing it. But I don't believe in that stuff. Okay. You know, and I was, if I'm being honest, at that time in my life, I was like kind of in the pool room I'd be with one girl one night I'd be with another Jason. girl another night so I was kind of like I had like a bunch of girls where I was just kind so then I'd be on my own I'd be bold and I'm like but the thing is that only lasts that's only good for so long that, that's what I'm getting at I yeah. was bold and I was always having to be like oh what am I doing oh I'll just call her or I'll, yeah. I'll call her and it, I kind of wanted to get to a point where I'm like I think it's time to really like you sort know settle out. down and do whatever but obviously at that point I wasn't looking to do that it just <laughs> happened you know and then now I'm like okay I need to so Aura was like so supportive of everything I'd done mm. and her mum and dad they supported me a little bit they were like you shouldn't have to get sponsored we, what we'll do is we'll put you in these events and you just mm. pay us back the money it costs and whatever you win you keep and I'm like I can't do that you know what I mean so they were like, you can, you need to keep the money for yourself. You can't be given half away of something you win. Like, so I finished third place at the US Open and I yeah. got $15,000 that, that in 2014. Mm. And I gave half of it away. Yeah. And they were like, you, you're a great player. You know what I mean? You, they knew how, how good I was. Yeah. Because they had like seen me playing. And they said, you can't be giving your money away. We'll put you in events and we'll just take the the the, the entry fee back and yeah. you keep it because obviously now I was You're providing, yeah. You know what I mean? They want me to be good. So I go to events and I'm doing whatever and I can't pot a ball and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is an absolute nightmare. But I was more worried about what was going to happen mm. with a baby coming. I'm the, mm. I, I don't know. I've never had, you know what I mean? Something like completely different. So eventually can't pot a ball I'm doing whatever and then finally the baby comes and at this time now I've went instead of um, like getting my green card and all that like I had to do a lot mm. of stuff I would have had to get like a p1 visa so I thought well I'm not going anywhere I'm gonna have a baby so I just said let's get married <laughs> Well, so romantic. <laughs> no, I, I didn't really say it like that. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I kind of did the right thing. So we got married. So now I can't leave the US. I got to stay in the US. So I can't go. I can't go out of the US anywhere. Mm. So I can't play in any events in the World Nine Ball. Mm. Can't go to Europe. Can't do nothing. I can't go anywhere. So I stayed there. Had the baby, and then two thousand and sixteen. I had the baby in 2014, 2015 I couldn't fly anywhere, I couldn't go to any tournaments. 2016 I finally got my green card which okay. meant I could fly out this to other events. Yeah, back but in business. In, yes, but in two, I had played in a lot of events in America and I'd been doing okay after the baby came. I'd been like doing pretty good and I went to the Moscone Cup in Vegas. Okay. I wanted to go and I was like, I'm going to get in the Moscone Just to what? I, I, no, I went, I, I said, I'm going to be in right. this one day. So I want to go and experience it. Okay. So in 2015, if you look back at the pictures, I was sat right in between the European players. Okay. And that was the year that um, Carl was on the team at Albin. Uh, Dennis Hatch was still playing for um, USA. Yeah. 
I think they got, they won like 11-2 or something. They hammered them. Okay. And I went there and I was like, I want to be in that. I want to get in next year. And 2016, I got my green card and I've been practicing like crazy. The baby came. Everything was good. I was in a good position. And then I went to the Kuwait Open. Okay. And that was my first major ranking event. I won. I won 50,000. Bloody hell. And then during the, while I was in the quarterfinal, I got my picture I posted on Facebook I was in the Moscone Cup no so I'm thinking happy days there's more money right yeah. so then because I'd won the cha- uh, because I won the Kuwait Open you I got, got the invited points, to yeah. the Challenge of Champions ah, okay and I beat Shane in the final and I got 25k so now I'm like gone from can't pot a ball and not making anything I've had the baby my life's kind of changed. I'm happy. Mm. Her dad's like became a different person. I feel like I'm more like involved. Yeah, with you got a family, like a family around, around you. me. I felt more secure. Started winning, and now all of a sudden, within a year, I've got like 120, 30 k in my pocket, and I'm in the Moscone Cup, and that was my first time playing, and it was in London, the Alley Pally. Yeah. And it was it was amazing. I I, I think I potted the winning nine ball at the Alley Pally in 2016. Mm. So everything just changed so quickly. And then 2017, I went to the Derby City, I won the Big Foot, I made another like 16 So you're on a high right now. On a high, then Mm. I won the US Open, my first US Open. Yeah. So everything just changed so quickly. Again, within like a year and a half again. I know, it seems. And then just, it was just like, um, my full life changed basically after having Liana. Yeah. And now it's like they're eight. I've got my other little boy now, he's four. Now like I own my own business, I have my own pool room, got my own family, a nice house. And like just just a crazy, crazy, what like 12 years of just a roller coaster of not knowing what I'm doing, thinking I'm playing snooker, back to English eight ball play American pool, going to the IPT and it folding, going back to English pool, going back to American pool and then coming to the States and making money and going back and forward and then having a baby. Then your dad. <laughs> yeah, just wild, wild. And obviously people say, oh man, you're so lucky, but I put a lot of effort into becoming a good player. It's not like I just played pool for a few hours a day. I was in the mm. pool room. 24-7, basically. Well, you listen to your story, it's like you've always been in a pool room or a snooker room. Yeah. It's, it's like you're there con- constantly. Constantly. And in New York, the pool room's like 24 hours. So yeah. I would, and I live across the road. And it's either I go back and go to sleep or I stay in the pool room and play pool and gamble and do whatever. And when you're young, you, you do that stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't care about sleeping. Mm. You're like, I oh, sleep, that's overrated. I'll just do what I want. So it was so wild. And then now... Within 2017, after I won the US Open, everything really changed because mm. then I'm in the Moscone Cup again mm. and now I'm really known, you know what I mean? Yeah, now yeah. I'm like standing there, I'm getting presented with my green jacket and I'm thinking back to when I used to tell my dad, I, I want one of them. Now I'm standing there, we're on. Just crazy, like, and it at that time it was so good because I had my daughter there she was just born like she was three and I had her there taking pictures with me it was just it was just unbelievable I'll always remember that so it's you listen to your story and it's you come across all these different situations and any normal person could have quite easily gone off the rails like when you think about the different levels of money that you're around like the amounts of money that you'd win at a certain point or at a time where you go, oh, I don't really have anywhere to now live. What what do I do? And you're around the pool rooms. You're around all of this money, and you could have quite easily just gone, you know, a little bit off track, sort of thing. Yeah. I think it's quite interesting because definitely when I first met you, I think mm-hmm. you have that level of arrogance about you. Which, by the way, I know you now personally, and I know that that's not actually you. Yeah. And you are like a family man, like just listening to how you spoke about, you know, oh, you had a responsibility to look after her when you first found out she was pregnant and you had to, you know, sharpen up, sort yourself out. But you do have that kind of arrogance that some people will look at you and go, oh, yeah, he's a bit cocky. But 
But actually, when it comes down to it, you're a proper family man and you really do, you take responsibility in who you're meant to look after. And that side of you now, I think, shines through when you get to know you as a person, which is actually really quite interesting because when you look at your story, you could have quite easily not turned out like that. Yeah. I think, I think even though a lot of people say, oh, he's like really cocky, he does this. It's not cocky, it's confidence. Mm. It's trying to, I know, I know what I have, I know what I can do. I'm not being cocky about it. I'm just showing like my confidence. It might come off as cocky. Uh, there's a couple other pool players that seem like, like a lot of people say Joshua is like that, but I know Joshua well, right? Yeah. And he's not being like, he, he just believes in himself and what he's about and mm. his confidence and people take it the wrong way. And then when they finally get to know you, they say, oh man, he's actually a good guy. I think it's in pool, you have to have that like, you know, a little get bit up and of, go. yeah, get up and go thing. And um, yeah, I've obviously, I had to change my ways. I've got, you know, I can't just go out and party and get hammered and do all that stuff. Um, but yeah, obviously I think Aura helped me a lot too. She really like kind of put the clamps on me and said, look, you have to look what you're doing to mm. yourself. You can't be going to these events and getting drunk and you're going there to win. That's, that's what you want to do, right? You're there to make money. Why would you go there and go out and get drunk before you've even played? That just makes no sense at all. Go there, play, do what you're supposed to do, win, and then go drink. Mm. Go party after it. And I was like, I'm doing all this backwards. <laughs> you know, I'm going out and getting hammered before I've even played, and then I can't pot a ball. Mm. So I mm. completely changed everything I was doing. I would, like, practice. I had the keys to a pool room now. Instead yeah. of going to a pool room, I've got keys. Yeah. So I would go to the pool room, practice for hours on end. Then I would go home and we would go back to the pool room together. And then while she was working or doing whatever, I'd be playing pool all night. So I was playing pool 24 seven. And I could tell the more I was playing, the more I could see my game was improving. Mm. And it was getting stronger and stronger. And she was pushing me to do better. So R is the key behind your success yeah, to get you on track. <laughs> She, she did, I think after the first year, after the baby, she really like did um, push me a lot. She made sure that I wasn't just making money and blowing it. You know yeah. what I mean? She was like, she's like my manager, if you yeah. want to say that. Yeah. And just making sure that I was doing the right things and she would drive me everywhere. She would take me wherever I had to be. And uh, she would drive 10, 12 hours to get me somewhere. You know yeah. what I mean? And that's, you know, I... I if it, if it wasn't for her, I probably wouldn't have went to half the places, you know what I mean? Um, and like you said, it was it could have been easy just to go off the rails and get 20, 30, 40, 50k and I'm in a casino and just go blow it. But I knew I had mm. um, her and the baby and, and now I've got a family and it kind of really did change me. And I think after having Liana, my full life changed and I started having more priorities um, set up and things to do. and and not just being stupid and silly, basically. Yeah. Well, when you look at you now, like, obviously, I know you like nice things, like your watches and things like that, and you've... To go from how you are now and you're travelling and, and, you know, like, having these nice things, just look back at how that was, like, that 16-year-old before you won that first 20 grand, for instance, you know working at the snooker hall, cleaning the tables. When you look back at the difference of that money, like, would you have ever thought that you would have been in this kind of position now, back then? If I'm being totally honest with you, it might sound a bit funny though, but when I used to be younger, I had three sisters growing up, right? And my dad used to take me on these tournaments. When I was like around 12 or 13, I had won like the World Junior Championship at English 8 Ball mm. and the youth in the same year. And we were all at home and I was saying to them, don't worry, I'll be famous one day. I'll be famous. And, you, and they were all laughing. That, yeah. And I said, don't worry, I'll be somewhere, living somewhere nice and having like a nice, I just used to say having a nice wife. And that, but I used to always <laughs> say, I'm never getting married ever. I'm never having a baby ever. And I used to always tell them this and they used to always laugh, right? Joking. I did believe that one day that I would be, 
a, a, a top player. I'd really always had it in me. When I was younger, I had... People always used to say the same thing like you just spoke about. Mm. It's like cockiness, mm. arrogance type of thing. But it wasn't. It was me believing, self-belief, mm. that I knew that I had something special. And my dad used to always try and tell me what to do this. Do I said, I'm doing, doing my own thing. Mm. You're not going to win anything if you don't listen to me. You're doing all these crazy shots with spin and draw and you don't even, you know, and, and I used to do it. And then after he'd say, how did you play that shot there? And I said, well, just my own thing. I believe mm. that I can do this. And I think if you believe in something and you put enough effort into it and you really put your mind to it, you can do anything, no matter who you are. If you really believe that you can do something and you put your mind to it and give it 100%, you can achieve anything. I really do believe that in life. And that's not just me. I think anybody can do that. And I just always believed in myself and believed that one day that I would be a top player. Uh, maybe if it wasn't at nine ball, maybe if it was at something else. Another, regardless, you Regardless, were gonna... I believed that I could be a top, top player at something. Mm. And... Yeah, obviously, when I look back and I think back in the days when I used to hang about the streets and, you know, drink and, you know, do crazy things, do I think I'll be living in the States and have a family and all that stuff? No, but do I believe that I was going to be good at something? Yeah. So I feel blessed to have what I have now. And obviously, I just, um, I just love my life. I just love playing pool. I love being around all the, the pool players and stuff like that. I like when you see me at events, a lot of players will do their own thing and whatever. I'm always chatting with everybody. Mm. I'm always hanging about doing, you know, it's just me. That's who I am. I'm just an outgoing person. I, I like to enjoy myself. Mm. Even when I'm having a bad time, I like to enjoy myself. You know? Well, I don't know. There's been some times when you've got the raging ump and, you, and yeah, it shows that you got even, even I'm raging, like, but then after you'll see me at the yeah. bar and I'm like drinking and I'm having a good yeah. time, you know what I mean? But it's sometimes in those moments when you've been beat, takes maybe an hour or two to really like mm. you know some players are different they just forget about it some players it takes a little while for them mm. to get over it but it just depends on how you lose too you can lose in a good way and think well i never really did anything and then there's other times where you're thinking how have i lost like yeah. how i should be still playing and then it's hard to be there watching while you're knocked out that makes it even worse and you're watching people miss and you're thinking oh he didn't miss against me why why me yeah so, yeah, I just feel I'm blessed to have what I have now. I worked hard for it. Um, you know, I, I, I did a lot of crazy things, did a lot of good things, and, um, yeah, I wouldn't change my life for anything. And finally, I'm just going to touch base on, so recently, I think, like, this year, you kind of, like, took a little bit of, like, a step back um, and was like, right, I'm going to go in the gym. I'm going to work on this. You come off social media a little bit. Just talk through, obviously, listening to how you are outgoing and things like that. That's quite a different uh, thing for you to do. So just talk through what happened then and how that maybe helped you and, and to how you are now today. So uh, I do believe that... Um, so 2019, I've been doing well all the way up from, since 2016 when I started doing really well. Every year I did well, I, I won a, a major event. 2018, I lost in the final of the China Open yeah. to Copenhagen, which was a big major event. So I st and I had just changed queue companies at that time. So then 2019, after playing a little bit with my new queues, I went to the Derby City, I won the Derby City Bigfoot, I won Turning Stone, then I won the International Open, and then go to Vegas and uh, we lost the Moscone Cup that year. I believe it was in Vegas. Yeah. Twenty nineteen was. was Vegas, yeah. yeah. And then two thousand oh, yeah, yeah, two thousand and twenty, I win Turning Stone, I win the Derby City, I fly to Europe for the first Euro tour, I win the Euro tour and I'm thinking I'm back, like I'm I'm this is it, I'm gonna go on one this year. And now two thousand and ninety eh, two thousand twenty, we got World Cup of Pool in Saudi Arabia. Mm. The prize money had doubled. All the big events coming up, World Nine Ball, US Opens, all that stuff. I'm like, okay, I'm flying. This is it. I'm gonna make a fortune. I just, I just had that, that buzz back. Mm. Then go to Vegas, get there, and now the world goes on lockdown. 
Mm. And I'm like, why me? Why, like, just as I'm playing well and I'm getting into that, you know, because 2018, I didn't do well, but I did well in the big event. Okay. And I was still struggling. I was going through it. And finally, I found my form and I found my game. And I'm thinking, all these big events, I can't wait. Time to really make some good money. And then now I go to Vegas and we go on lockdown and I go back home. And now I know there's not going to be any events for, what, over a year, mm. maybe a year and a half. So I go home and I'm, you don't, at, at, at the start, you weren't really thinking much about it, no. right? Thinking three months, it'll probably go yeah. away. Didn't know anything you know, about you it. You didn't know much about it. But then it's like, we went into like six, seven months. I was just depressed. Like I was so like, people, I could see people were doing practicing online and doing whatever. And I'm like, what, what am I practicing for? Mm. I don't know when the next event is. So I'm just eating like crazy gained a lot of weight, was like just kind of down in the dumps, wasn't really with it. And then 2021 started having some events again, but I was like showing up to events where I've not played. I felt terrible mentally. I felt terrible physically. I looked bad. I just felt bad. I like, I, I was like, knew I was like fat. I'd gained a lot of weight. I felt terrible. I just, I just wasn't feeling good myself. Mm -hmm. And I kind of was like depressed, if you could call it that. And I just wasn't enjoying nothing. Like I didn't, when I was going to events, I just didn't care. I wasn't even bothered. I was like, just, I, I didn't feel anything. And something that I'm supposed to love doing, I've got no feeling for it at all. So I was just kind of going through the motions. I was even telling like, oh, I don't, I don't care. I don't want to play anymore. I want to quit. It was just weird. That sounds and so weird hearing you say yeah, that. Yeah, it was weird. I just, um, it was like in a, I was in a bad spot really and I just kind of wasn't enjoying it. And I was like, I, I don't know. I just didn't want to play. And then 2021, towards the end, I was doing nothing. I wasn't making any money playing pool. I wasn't doing nothing. And I thought, do you know what? They wanted to sell the pool room to someone else. And I thought, let's buy the pool room, let's do that. And then when I bought it and I started ripping everything apart, I thought, what am I doing? Like, you know, I just kind of was like, I'm supposed to be a pool player, I'm buying a pool room. And um, so then my full mind changed. So then when I started like ripping the place apart, I wanted to get it the way I wanted to have it, right? Okay. So then I started like working every day. I was like, and I was like kind of getting out that funk of mm. just lying in bed. Yeah, it's a motivation. Eating, motivation. And I'm like hiring people to work. And when they're not there, I'm there all night doing their job, ripping all the stuff apart. And then when they'd come, they'd say, what happened here? And I'd say, I've got it ready for you. All you <laughs> have to do now, because I wanted the pool room to open quickly. Okay. So I would prep everything when I'm paying them and they're supposed to do it. Yeah. So I got out that little funk okay. and everything. And then when I was showing up at events in uh, 2022, the start of the year, mm -hmm. just things were just still the same. I was going there with, in my mind, I was having like crazy doubts when I was playing. Like I was getting into matches and I'm thinking about crazy things like, oh, probably I'm about to lose this match or I'll miss this ball. And it's just weird. Like, like the confidence. Yeah, just confidence went. is just completely gone. And then I thought I'd found a little bit of it back. And then I went to a few events and used a couple of events, I never really got a shot. I got beat like quick. I got beat like 7-2, I've not had a shot. I went to World Cup of Pool, I've had one shot. Yeah. Just And then I went back into like, I just went back into that depressed mode. I was like thinking to myself, I don't, I need to get away from this, I don't even want to play. And she was saying like, there's a lot of events, just play and I was like, I'm done. Like, get me away from everything and just get me out of here. So I've gone away to Dubai for two weeks. I've ended up staying for a month. And mm -hmm. while I was there, I just kind of was like, this is where I need to like change myself. I need to start working out. I need to work on myself. Don't go on social media, get away from it, get away from all that stuff. Don't interact with it. Just focus on who I had around me. Yeah. Try and get good people around me. Have close friends to me, giving me good advice. You know, don't, all that negative stuff, just get it away from me. And then I started training and then within like two or three weeks, I'd lost like 20 pounds. 
I was really dialed in. I was focused. I was like, okay, I, I need to get back to where I'm at mm. because I knew I, I know I know it's there, right? But it's mostly this is where this is where it's at. It's, it's here mm. and physically, I was here. I was in a bad spot and physically, I wasn't in a good spot. So I had to change those two. So I got myself around good people, and I just was eating good, training hard, practicing. wasn't on social media. And I just put myself through a really, the last four months have been really tough as far as like having to just punish myself, keep going to the gym, keep eating yeah. well, don't don't go off and say, well, I'll not go today, I'll go tomorrow. Yeah. That only leads to not going tomorrow. Exactly. And then a week down the line, I'm eating bad food again and I'm in a bad spot. So I just kept doing that. I kept going to the gym, mm. kept motivating myself, you know, I would like watch a lot of motivation, like videos and get stuff to pump me up. Mm. And I would talk to people who knew what I was going through okay. to, and they were helping me, you know, do this, just stay yourself, do what you're doing. And I'd go back to see my personal trainer and kind of had a, a good chat with him and kind of told him what I was going through. And he, he's, he does all that stuff like for like baseball teams and he's like a motivation guy. And I just kind of try to now stay in my my circle mm. where I know my people who are going to be supportive of me, and yeah. and just try and keep that circle tight and not kind of get out and go drinking or whatever. And I kind of changed a lot of things after the World Cup. I pull up. I promised myself that I would stop doing stupid things that I'd been doing for a long time, and completely just quit it. And I've done that and I'm really proud of myself for doing it because I did that for a long time. I don't know if it affected me, but I feel like it's helped me going forward the last four or five months because I really have changed um, mentally. Now I, I don't feel like, I don't feel like stupid little things are creeping in. Mm. I'm like, just can get it away out of my mind even without, if it just creeps in, I know how to get rid of it. And I've just changed everything personally, and I've got a good group of people around me now who are helping me, and um, I feel good that I'm back, you know, down to a good bit of my normal weight, and mentally I feel like strong. I'm stronger, and um, you know I just I feel like I had to take time away to refocus and get myself back because I think if I didn't then. I think I would have just went really off the boil and who knows, I could have been really in the dumps. But you know, mm. a lot of people, a lot of people don't, don't think that they can speak or talk about it, but I don't, I don't mind because at the end of the day, I would rather talk about it and get it off my chest mm. than have it all, you know, and oh, it bulked up and, and then do something stupid or, you know, it's like, it's easy to do it. And I just think that, you know, if you've got something on your chest, you should get it off and try and get the right people around you and, and, and get help or do whatever it takes to, to get back to where you're at. Oh, huge respect to you because any other person could have just gone a different way. So I think it's absolutely commendable. And even just sitting here, all I want now is you to just take a tournament down and win it. That's, that's what I, you know, I think I'm like kind of, I don't know, it's weird. Kind of like get emotional. Well, we can end there. Listen, I think that was absolutely brilliant. I absolutely loved that. I've seen a completely different side to you. I just think, remember after the UK Open when you were just, was it the UK Open? No, the World Cup pool when you messaged and you said, oh, uh, you're like, I just need to stop for a bit now. And you, you were away, I remember when you were away in Dubai for a bit and you just seemed to be with the kids were there, weren't they? 
out dinner. Connor was having the T-bone steak every night. <laughs> <laughs> you're making it's just it crazy <laughs> just like it's crazy like just go through like people don't get it though like there's so much like pool obviously is mental right <laughs> it is it is you like you go like from highs to lows and people just don't get it people think everything's okay and because you've got kids and a family and all that stuff but you know there's there's a lot of stuff mentally that can break you and you know it did, it broke me hard and I just needed time to try and regroup and refocus and just get away from it. It's tough because one day you're on a high and the next day you just want to end it, you know what I mean? You want to quit, like it's just, it's just a crazy game. And um, Did you feel like you kind of had a bit of a persona at the events like you were saying? you'll chat to everyone and people will come and chat to you. Like the amount of people when you're downstairs, so many people come up and they're like, Jason, you're very approachable to talk yeah. to. And it must be difficult because obviously if you're feeling how you've just been feeling like at a World Cup pool, for instance, you don't want to go and talk to someone like that, but you still put that front on. That's what I mean, you, you, you front it, right? To, to make yourself still feel like everything's okay. I feel like a lot of guys do that. And then deep down the they have that like it's like they're hiding it you know what I mean they hide it well but like R always says to me just tell me like what's up with you and I'm like I'm fine I'm good mm. and that, like I think that's like a guy thing like they, they hide it right they bottle it all up they bottle it all up and it just gets worse and worse and worse that's why I just was like you know I need time away you know I'm, I did the, I even posted that I'm just mentally broke and I was, and um, it was tough, man, I really did that. I just didn't want to do anything. I, I wanted to give up. I just wanted to, I just didn't want to do anything. And it's crazy, because everybody's like, oh, he's still just drinking at the bar and whatever, but that's like, it's like hidden, right? Mm. It's like you say, you, you're drinking, you just get hammered and whatever, and then you the it. next day you're like lying in bed and you don't want to get up, or you don't want to work out, or you just don't want to talk to anybody. People were calling me all the time and I wouldn't answer the phone to them, you know? I would answer the phone to people who I felt like I could like chat to or talk to, but people that I knew, I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to talk to them. And that's not good, you know what I mean? So I, I do think that taking um, some time away and working on myself definitely helped me. Um, mentally obviously it's still tough but I know that now that I know what to do to get away from it and how to handle it better and um, not put myself back into that like stupid crazy like depressed mode and thinking that I'm not good enough or whatever um, I know that that's not the case I know I'm you know I'm, I'm still early in my career you know what I mean I'm 34 I'm supposed to be in my prime um, so I know I've got a lot left in my tank for the next eight, ten years, you know, and um, all I've got to do is just continue doing what I'm doing. I, I'm playing really well. I know I'm playing really good. I've put a lot of time and effort into to fixing myself. Um, just got to go out there and do what I do best and just stay focused and try and, um, you know, try and grind and win. You know, I'd love to, this is something I'd love to add, another US Open, mm -hmm. like this is, it was all my, always my dream to win the US Open, and I've done it once, so I know I can do it again. And um, I think if I was to win this, I don't know if I would, I'd probably be crying till next week. <laughs> it would just be um, unbelievable, but you know, one match at a time, and yeah. um, let's see what happens. Well, you deserve it. I think we can end it there. <laughs>